Hello, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's listening. I'm Hugh James, one of the lay ministers at St Paul's, and it's my privilege to be bringing God's Word today. Let's start by a prayer. Lord, send your Spirit onto my lips and into all our hearts, that we may learn more of the will of Jesus for our lives. Amen. I was preaching here at St Paul's on Sunday the 16th of February. It wasn't long after New Year. Doesn't that seem an eternity away now? And the sermon was part of a special series for the New Year, a New Year health check. And the topic that I'd been given was Guard Your Heart with verses from chapter 4 of the book of Proverbs. In my Bible, those verses have been given a heading. Get wisdom at all costs. And as I talked about wisdom, I mentioned the same account of King Solomon asking for wisdom that we heard in our first reading today. That story made such an impression uh, on the biblical writers that it's repeated in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 17. Speaking about this account then, uh, had, the, speaking then, had only been relevant to the theme of wisdom. But as I came back to it today, I noticed several other very important underlying themes. Why had Solomon asked for wisdom? Because he was humble. He felt that he was inadequate. And he was felt that he was facing a task that was too big for him. I'm only a child, he told God, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. You might have thought that being the son of the great King David would have prepared him for royal duties. But when he says, you've made your servant king in the place of my father David, was that part of the problem? Did he feel that he could never match his great father? Do you ever feel like that? I do. My father was not someone who found it easy to pass on his skills. And yet he held high standards. It was easy to feel never quite good enough. There may be many of you who find that yourselves, who find yourselves in the same position as Solomon. Be encouraged that Solomon felt like that and that God didn't hold it against him. But he was also very conscious of how hard the task would be, how large the tribe was, as he put it, too numerous to count or number. But he had the humility to recognise that these were not his people, they were God's people, your people, as he says. So if he were to get things wrong for them, he would be getting it wrong for God. What are you up against at present? Is there some situation that you're responsible for that feels too hard for you? Take courage with Solomon as he prays, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. In the present pandemic, we've seen advice fluctuate wildly at one moment we were told that wearing a mask was wrong, even though many of the parts of the world were advising it. And now it's not only right, 
it becomes compulsory in many circumstances. When advice becomes too complex, people do begin to feel that nothing matters. Only this week I encountered someone who, despite being part of the Leicester lockdown, had spent time in the previous week with his family in a caravan at Skegness. Solomon knew that government would be difficult, that there wouldn't always be simple answers, and he prays for a right judgment. I think that's important today, that we must be praying for all our leaders, that God may give them wisdom as they make their choices between the many options available. May they know the wisdom of Solomon, or more correctly, the wisdom of God. But then our readings turn from the ruling of a traditional kingdom to the rule of of the new kingdom, the rule of the kingdom of God. As a, a good Jew, Matthew tries to avoid speaking the name of God, and so he calls it the kingdom of heaven. But it's the same thing. These are parables, each teaching one important point, not allegories where every individual part of the story has its own meaning. And they're a group of parables. But what do they have in common? And what is different? These parables tell us very little about the nature of the kingdom. What the difference is between this kingdom and the traditional kingdoms. But I think there's a bit of a clue in the last parable of the sequence. Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple of the kingdom is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. I'd suggest that the old treasure that the teacher who now belongs to the new government is talking is taking from his storeroom is the relationship that God has built up with the children of Israel with Adam, Noah, Abraham and Jacob and now he has demonstrated himself as a saving God as he brought his people out of Egypt into the promised land But that old covenant had always failed, as people had always turned away from the one true God and worshipped the gods of their neighbours. But that old covenant had always pointed forward, forward to the one who would come, the Messiah, the Christ. So the coming of Christ was not separated, not divorced, from the old covenant. It was promised by it. Another shortcoming of the old treasure, the old covenant, was its limitation to the children of Israel. It would still be a long time beyond our reading that God would reveal to Simon Peter on the rooftop of Jophthah what's recorded in Acts 10 that his treasure was to be for all who would receive it and not just Jews. Two of the parables describe the kingdom of God as a pearl. Both of them speak of its being highly valuable. But there's a discussion point here. Who or what is this pearl? Is it Jesus? for whom we should be prepared to sacrifice ourselves and all that we have? Or is that pearl ourselves, for whom Jesus sacrificed himself at Calvary? 
that we might know his love and be part of his kingdom. I don't know the answer. Does, but does Christ mean so much that you would give all, all that you have to follow him? The rich young ruler was asked to by Jesus. The first Christian missionaries in West Africa went there knowing that the average life expectancy would be six months. And yet they went for the love of Christ. How does our love for him match that? Disease may no longer be the enemy, but there are persecuted Christians around the world still willing to make that sacrifice. And does the alternative reading of Christ being the one willing to give everything, even himself, to save you, challenge you? Does it challenge you to share that love with others? The first two parables, the fig tree and the yeast, both speak of how the church will grow. And indeed, and especially after Pentecost, it did. So now it encompasses every country on the planet to at least some extent. So let's praise God for that. But the last main parable, the fishnet, is more sombre. It reminds us that there is only a, a limited time until that final day when judgment will come, when the fish will be sorted, good from bad, righteous from unrighteous. And as we heard last week, when the, the, when the weeds will be separated from the wheat, Christ came that we might have life, life in all its fullness, before death, and on the Day of Judgment. That final judgment is mentioned in many of Jesus' parables and teachings. Exactly what hell means, the fire, the casting into darkness, I do not know. But what I am sure of is that if it had, been, if it had not been really unpleasant, Jesus would not have come and gone to the cross and died for us, to save us from it. Especially where, even in the very thought of his crucifixion, when Jesus thought of it in the Garden of Gethsemane, it caused him to sweat great drops of blood. Let's never make light of how much that cost. So let's pray. Heavenly Lord, give us your wisdom to follow you in word and deed. In Jesus' name. Amen.